What's up, Refinery Church? As Casey said, my name is Michael, and I get to, to serve at Real Life Church in Valencia, California. So if you know where Six Flags is at, that's, that's where we're at, right across the street from there. And uh, yeah, we, we love the Refinery Church. I came on opening weekend. What an amazing weekend it was. And we're blessed actually to be a part of the refinery. So we don't consider it, you guys are part of us. We're a part of you and what God is doing here. And can we give it up for Casey and Amy, your fearless leaders? Man, it was amazing. We love this couple. They're awesome, they're great, and uh, we uh, just, we're really excited for what God is going to be doing uh, here in Temecula. Well, let me just tell you what the best part of me is. I'm going to show you a picture of my family. Uh, they are here with us today, and so that's my beautiful wife, Erica, that's there, and then the oldest, the, the second tallest in our family, Kira, that's our oldest there, and then Ashlyn, and then our seven-year-old son, Cohen who uh, is learning to tie a shoe, and he's going to be a rock star when he fi figures that out. So we're excited for him. It's a big, big moment in our house here as well, too. So, uh, But yes, I'm blessed to have a beautiful family, and they are amazing. Um, so we are here. You guys have been in a series called The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. And what we are finding as we read this, this book called the Bible is that God does not edit out the failures of its heroes. You notice that? When you read the Bible, you notice that God puts all the good, the bad, and the ugly about its characters in there. Nothing is edited out. We see their whole life on display. And what the hope of this series is, is that you could see that God can work in you and through you, even in your mess, even in your goodness, even in the places that you keep in the closet that you don't want no one on, God can actually work in you. And one of the things I'm discovering and been discovering in my own personal life is that one of the ways that God works through us is this idea called the dark room. Okay, and that's what we're going to be spending our time talking about today. Now, have you ever heard of the dark room? If, if, if uh, let me show you a picture here of what this looks like. Uh, way back in the day, and even till even today, the, the real photographers, the ones that print out, not, not us iPhone photographers, right? We cheat now, right? But back in the day, I remember when I was a kid, you know, you would uh, you get these little fake, these little cameras, and you would, right? And then you take a picture of it, and then you have to go to the store, and then you, you turn it in, and then they do the development process, right? Well, what would happen is they would go into these rooms here, and they would put uh, these uh, the photos in these little things, and they had to go through these processes in order to be developed. Okay, it's not like today where we can just you know we have these really nice iPhones and we could take pictures of them and it's all perfect and they could do all these cool things to it. I mean, if you have an Android, you're going to hell anyways. But anyways, but wow. only iPhone people are going to heaven. Oh okay. <laughs> but uh, so like you know with with those, these cool phones, you could do all these things. You know, because we live in a world that is really about instant gratification. Have you noticed that? I mean, we want things so fast. I mean, at the advent of the microwave, it literally changed our life. But in, these, in the filming, in, in the dark room, it doesn't happen instantly. It's actually a process that takes time. See, we, we, we all struggle with that because, again, we live in a world of instant development, instant gratification. We want things faster than we've ever wanted before. Case in point, I remember when I was a junior in high school, and I was kind of a loser. No, not kind of. I was definitely a loser in high school. And there was this, uh, there was this girl, and uh, her name was Priscilla, and she was like one of the most popular kids in school. And she was dating this other kid named Sonny who was also really popular. Well, they broke up, okay, and it was prom season. And I thought, this is my one shot. Okay, listen, you only get one shot to shoot your shot, okay? <laughs> so I went to Priscilla, I said, look, I'd love to take you to prom. And to my amazement and surprise, she said yes, okay? So I was really excited. So you only get one shot, so I was gonna do this up big, okay? So I went out and I rented a car, so we we're gonna get picked up in the, the Crown Vic, you remember Crown Vic? Yeah. <laughs> Crown Vic, but the nice kind, okay? Crown Vic, okay? 
Yeah. All right, I had like the three-piece tux, right, with the cummerbund and the and the uh, bow tie. I bought her a corsage. I mean, we were going to do it up. Like, so I, I'm originally from Florida, okay? So the plan was we were going to go to the beach, okay? We are going to go to the beach. We are going to go to a nice restaurant. Then we'd go to prom. We were going to dance the night away, and then we are going to end the night back at the beach, okay? So we go, we, you know, I pick her up and she gets in the car, open the door for her and she's like smiling, looking great. And I'm looking pretty dapper, all right? And so we, we go out to dinner, we're having a great time. Then we go to the prom and we're just dancing the night away. Oh my gosh, I don't think she ever laughed so hard in her life. I think she just was glowing, right? So then we end the night, we're, we, we, we're all walking on the beach and uh, she takes off her shoes and I was like, oh, can I hold those for you? So I'm holding it for her, and you know the moon is glistening just perfectly in her face. And as we're walking, you know how you know how like you remember the day like when you were young, like you get kind of brush your like pinky finger up against each other to see if she'll let you like hold her hand or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I love the affirmation. Keep it coming, okay? Yeah. So you like brush your hand, like oh yeah, and then so I brush my hand against her, and then she just slipped her hand right. I was like, whoo! Okay, you know, okay. So we're just walking, we're talking, laughing. And we just kind of stop and just sit there, and the, the, the moon is just glistening. And I just thought, you get one chance to shoot your shot. It's my junior year. I've always wanted to be with someone. So I'm going to pop the question to her. I'm going to pop the question, because that's what we should do, right? Lock it down. <laughs> so I turned to her, and I said, Priscilla, will you marry me? And that ended the date real fast. You see, because we want things right now. I'm skipping the whole dating process. We don't need all that. Let's just get married right now. Okay? Obviously, I did not. I married someone 10 times better than her. But that's the thing. We live in a world that, man, we just want things so fast. We want it now. We want to deal with it now. But you see, the dark room is not instant. It's a process of development. You know those photos? They have to actually go through nine different chemical processes for it to be developed. And what happens is when you put the photos into these different chemical things, it actually crushes up the film. It doesn't just like make it, it actually crushes up the film and it brings the film together to produce this picture, this beautiful picture that you get to see. This process takes time and it can't be rushed, it can't be skipped, skimmed, or, or cheated. And if during the process, if during this thing, you, um, if you open the room, the door, too soon, if the light gets into that room before this, this film is developed, it will ruin the film. It will be completely unrecoverable. Okay? Here's another thing we're discovering about our lives today. I don't know if you notice this, but we all have this desire to be discovered. You know, Amy kind of talked about this earlier with the, 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 those who feel, you know, left out or unseen and unheard. This is a massive thing that's going on in our society right now. This idea that we need people to see us for us. We have this aching and this desire to be discovered, whether it's your boss discovering you doing a great project at work or your spouse discovering you doing something nice or some great achievement you have, or maybe it's a sports achievement or, or you want to be discovered on a dating website or whatever it may be on Instagram to become an influencer. We all want to be discovered so that we get our time in this spotlight. And that, you know, can be especially true about our faith. And a lot of us are waiting. We're not volunteering. We're not giving our time, talent, or resources. We're not serving. We're not getting deeper. We're not telling our friends about this great love of Jesus because we're waiting for God to discover us. God, can you see what I'm doing here, Right? We're waiting for that. And here's the thing about this that you have to understand. It's not discovery that you need. It's development. It's development. It's development. We need to be developed, not discovered. But a lot of us, including myself, we've missed the development process because we're like, God, hello, somebody, look at me. And let me just be... Let me just be real about this. This is, this is coming out of a lot of personal experience in my own life. If it's man's discovery that you're after, it's man's discovery that can destroy you. 
I'm gonna say it again. And I mean man, I don't mean just like the man, sexual logical man, I mean like humans. If it's a person's discovery, if you're waiting for someone to affirm you, some other person, guess what? That same person can destroy you. Destroy. What I mean by that is that if you're seeking the approval of a person, be it a friend, a supervisor, a spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, or someone else, that approval can work against you as well. So it's not the discovery of man that you should be after, it's the development of God that you should be after. It's the dark room. And I know it sounds scary because of this process and how it takes time, but let me tell you, when you go to the dark room, it will do wonders, not only to your faith, but to your life. Okay? You see, the object of the dark room is what God is trying to do is he's trying to take the light that's in you and make it bigger than the light that is on you. Okay? He's trying to take the light that's in you, the good that he has already put in you. He's trying to work it through so it becomes bigger than the light that gets on you. Because if the light that is on you is bigger than the light that's in you, you can be destroyed easily. You know, I love um, Christine Kane. She's one of my favorite pastors, teachers, and she's the leader of an a organization called A21 that works with uh, rescuing women from sex trafficking. And here's what she says about this. She says, the degree to which you are willing to allow God to do what needs to be done in you is the degree to which God can work in you and through you. You see what I'm saying? If you open yourself up to this process and you allow God to do a real work in you, a hard work, a difficult work, but a good work, I'm going to tell you, it's going to be better than you could have ever imagined. Now, the people... What's really interesting about this is that the people of God, the the ancient Hebrews, they they had a phrasing for this. They called it anointing by crushing. Now, that word anointing is just another way of saying chosen, okay? You see, God loved his people, but oftentimes they disobeyed God or they lost faith. And so what God would do is he would allow Okay, he would allow their their brokenness, their mistakes, their turning away from him to get the best of them because he knew and understood that it was only in those circumstances when things got difficult and hard, would they then open their ears and heart to what God is trying to do in their life. So they would experience losing family members to war and to famine to uh, from oppression from their enemies to exile. Isaiah uh, talked about this a lot, about how the people yearned for this anointing, but they had to figure out that it was going to come through this crushing. And so they experienced these hard times. And there were times that they wanted to give up and quit, but you know what? They didn't. And eventually they got to see how being the anointed of God led to being the appointed people of God. And I believe that for you in the house today, that's how I refer to the church as the house, that If you find yourself going through just a really difficult time, if you find yourself feeling like, man, God, where are you in this trial, in this mess, in this hurt? If you find yourself dealing with the consequences of of maybe some just not good mistakes and uh, good choices, can I tell you, you are in the dark room. And God is trying to get your attention because there is a good that he wants to develop out of that. There is an anointing out of that crushing he wants to do in you and then eventually through you to the rest of your relational world. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to spend some time looking at the, the, the beginning story of David, King David, okay? But before he was king. Now, if you have a Bible or it's going to be on the screen, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 16. Just to give you a little bit of context, last week Casey talked about how the people of the Old Testament wanted a king, okay? They never had a king before. They had these prophets who led, and God warned them, like, if you want a king, I'll get you a king, but you're literally going to have to sacrifice everything to this king. You're going to be subject to this ruler. And they were like, no, 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 we want a king. We want to be like everybody else, okay? So so God goes and, and has Samuel anoint this guy named Saul to be the king. And Saul was this guy who followed God and trusted God. And so God said, okay, you're going to be king. And it started out great. But then Saul got too big. The light on Saul was bigger than the light in Saul. And then so, so God said, you know what? You're not going to listen. You're not going to trust my development process. You want to be instant gratification. You're, at, you're asking people to marry you at prom and junior high. That's it. You're done. Okay? 
Basically, that's what happened. And so God said, you know what? I'm done with Saul. I'm going to anoint a new king. So we're going to pick up in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16. It'll be on the screen for you. It says this. It says, now the Lord said to Samuel, you have mourned long enough for Saul. I have rejected him as king of Israel. So fill your flask with olive oil and go to Bethlehem. Find a man named Jesse who lives there. For I have selected one of his sons to be my king. But Samuel asked, how can I do that? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. Take a heifer with you, the Lord replied, and say that you have come to make a sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you which of the sons to anoint for me. So Samuel did as the Lord instructed. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town came trembling to meet him. What's wrong, they asked. Do you come in peace? Yes, Samuel replied. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Purify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then Samuel performed the purification rites for Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice too. When they arrived, catch this, Samuel took one look at Elab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. But the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse told his son Abinadab to step forward and walk in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, this is not the one the Lord has chosen. Next, Jesse summoned Shimei, but Samuel said, neither is this the one the Lord has chosen. In the same way, all seven of Jesse's sons were presented to Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chose any of these. Then Samuel asked, are all these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse replied, but he is out in the fields watching the sheep and goats. Send for him at once, Samuel said. We will not sit down to eat until he arrives. So Jesse sent for him. He was dark and handsome with beautiful eyes. This is the way I ask my wife to introduce me when I walk into a room. <laughs> this is my husband. He is dark and handsome. <laughs> Just kidding. I wish. In my dreams, right? Uh, and then the Lord said, this is the one, anoint him. So as David stood there among his brothers, Samuel took the flask of olive oils he had brought and anointed David with the oil. And the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. Then Samuel returned to Ramah. This is the reading of the words. So God is done with Saul. And now he wants to anoint a future king of Israel. And this is where David enters into the story at the next stage of development into who God is crafting and developing him to be. So the rest of our time, I just want to point out some lessons I think we learned from just this part of David's journey. One of the first things we see at the beginning of this story is this idea about heart over appearance. Okay. I think God points it out very quickly that he cares about your heart over your parents. You see, Samuel sees Jesse's sons, right? And in the first son he sees, literally before they get anything done, he sees, he sees Jesse's first son. And he says, oh, yeah, look at that dude. He's swole. Mm. He look good. That's definitely who the Lord wanted. He must be the Lord's anointed. That boy right there, real strong and good looking, right? Samuel sees this boy and assumes that because what appears on the outside, the inside must be just as good. You see, Samuel had this outward to inward belief system. You know, you and I struggle with that too. You know, we look at people, right? We have this outward to inward belief system. We look at people and we assume what we see on the outside must be what is happening on the inside of them right? We, we assume that that's who they are. So if they have a nice car or a nice house or they have a nice job, then we assume that they're rich or they're well off. Or if someone appears happy all the time, we assume that they are having a great life. Or if a couple always posts pictures of themselves kissing and going out to romantic dates, we assume that their marriage is perfect and they never fight, right? We notice people who might be spiritual, who they're always praying or they're always talking about Jesus or, or they they always have answers for difficult things. We think, man, their faith must be really deep. When we're driving around town and we see people at the KFC line instead of Chick-fil-A, we're like, they're going to hell for sure, right? Because they're not at Chick-fil-A. That's the Lord's chicken. <laughs> we assume that. You see, the point is we use their appearances and impressions to judge the content of their heart. And so what happens is we think, oh, well, then I have to look like that. 
That's the standard of definition. That's the standard of success. That's my barrier. That's my barometer, my thermometer of where I get to is I got to look like that person. I got to be like her. I got to be like that Insta mom. She's probably a perfect parent. Look at her taking videos of her kids just being having, right? <laughs> Who, yeah, behaving. That's a, that's a word, okay? But see, that's not what God is after or what he wants. No, no, no. He wants what we can't see, what we can't fake, what can't be hide behind appearances. You see, God looks at the heart. God looks at the heart. God says to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height because I have rejected him. You see, the Lord doesn't see the things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Now, not like your, your, your ticking heart. I remember one time, sometimes when my oldest daughter, when she was a little bit younger, she used to like be really mean to her brother and sister. I, I used to say to her, I'd be like, Kira, you, you, you need to check your heart, okay? You need to check your heart. And one time I said, Kira, you need to check your heart. And she's like, Dad, you need to check your heart because you're getting old, all right? <laughs> she real bad, okay? <laughs> but the point, I bring that up is because, see, we're not talking about the physical heart. The thing is, that, that, that physical heart, that thing that's beating, that's getting the blood through your body, that's temporal. You see, God is talking about your spiritual heart. It's known as your soul because that is eternal. And God is looking at your heart and maybe he's seeing some things that aren't so good, things that aren't healthy, things that need to be removed. Maybe it's your motives or maybe it's your desires. Maybe it's some envy that you're, you're living in. Maybe it's some discontentment you're dealing with. Whatever it is, God can see it. And he knows that the only way to get rid of it for you is for you to spend some time in the dark room. Because he's anointed you for something. But in order to get to that appointment, you got to go through a little bit of crushing. Right? you got to go through a little bit of that. God can see it. And he wants to work those kinks out. He wants to flesh out those bad thoughts. He wants to crush those unhealthy desires in you so that what appears on the outside is exactly what's happening on the inside. Now, did you notice in the initial lineup, okay, when, 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 when Samuel's going through Jesse's first seven sons, who's absent from that lineup, right? See, Jesse is kind of basically, or Samuel's kind of going through, and he's like swiping left on all these people. He's like, nah, you're too arrogant. Nope, you're too envious. Nope, you're not faithful enough. Nope, you don't have a servant heart. Nope, he's a Dodger fan. Uh, I'm a Red Sox fan, so, you know, we're awesome, okay? Uh, he's just swiping left on all those people, right? And he just, he, and he's swiping left. And, and, and then he looks at Jesse and says, you know, is this it? Is it all it is? And Jesse says, no, 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 they're still the youngest. But he's out in the fields watching the sheep and goat. You know what basically that translates? He's not important enough. Don't worry about him. These are my good looking ones. These are the ones you need to like look at. Look at them. Look at them. They look so good. Look at their toned muscles. They've been doing yoga. It's all great. Like, look at them. Those are the ones you need to focus on. Don't worry about him. That dude is out doing what, whatever. And God says, no, that's the guy I want. That's the one. You see, David is out doing what he's supposed to be doing. Now, we don't know why he wasn't initially invited, but David's out there minding his own business. The party is happening on the inside. The place to be is there, not out in the fields. Okay? All of Jesse's sons are here where the party's happening. Why? Because they know who Samuel is. They know Samuel comes as a prophet, as a voice of the Lord, the mouthpiece of the Lord. So if they're near Samuel, they're trying to get what? Discovered by God, right? They're seeking notoriety. But that's not what David is after. And I think it's no accident that David is out in the fields. I believe God is showing us another thing that we can learn is obscurity over notoriety. Here's what I mean. David could have come to the party and flaunted himself. Hey, guys, Denzel's here because he was dark, right? He could have showed up and said, I'm here, guys. Hello, the man. Thank you. Move over. 
right? He could have done all that, but he doesn't. He continues to serve in the capacity which he was called to at that point. He's out in the field, which is far from the house where the party is at. While everyone else is at the party, you see, David isn't chasing fame. He isn't chasing fortune. He isn't chasing notoriety. He is chasing development. See, it's hard to be developed when the spotlight is on you. You ever thought about that? It's hard to be developed when the spotlight is on you because the spotlight reveals all your flaws, all your mess, all your mistakes, right? And it's hard to get that development because when you are in the development process, your attention is focused and clear. You see, the dark room doesn't just remove things in us that are holding us back. It also develops in us the things that propel us forward. Now, you might be thinking, okay, how does obscurity move us forward? Because obscurity literally means a state of unknown or uncertainty. How can the unknown or the uncertainty move us forward when it seems like it only holds us back? Well, here's the thing. Obscurity works differently for, for, for different people, for all of us. It's, it's going to work differently. For some of us, it means that you might be removed out of a job. For some of us, it might mean an end of a relationship or out of a promising situation. For others, it might be a season of where you've been single and you're like, man, I'm ready to mingle, but nothing is happening because there's a point in why God hasn't brought that person to you right now because there's still work to be done on you before you're ready for that other person. Or before you're ready for that promotion, God might not want to put you in that job because he knows that if he puts you in that promotion right now, you're going to fail miserably. So he's prepping you for that promotion. Maybe you've been struggling to have kids and you're just like, God, why aren't you, do, why aren't you giving that to me? Maybe it's not that he's not going to give you a kid. Maybe he's just prepping you for the season of parenting. Right? You see... Oftentimes we think, oh, man, God's not doing this for me. He must hate me. No, 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 no. He's not doing it for you right now because he loves you. And if he puts you in it right now, it would be more devastating than promising. Wow. Wow. Yeah. You see, that's what it looks like. That's what obscurity looks like. You see, if you're in that situation right now, I don't want you to fret. I want you to know that there is purpose in your obscurity. Here's what obscurity does. It clears our mind and it helps us focus on the race that we've been called to run. You and I have been given a specific purpose. And what happens often is that when the spotlight shines on us before we are ready, before we are fully developed, we start running in lanes we weren't meant to run. And when that happens, we get sideways with our time and our energy and our motives and our desires. You see, I love what Christine Kane says about this. She says, you will only ever have grace for your race and no one else's. You understand that? You will only ever have grace for your race. Meaning that when you start running in a race lane that, that you weren't developed for, man, you have no patience. You have no time. You start thinking that it's yours and you start sacrificing everybody else to run a race that you were never meant to run. But when, you run in the, but when you run in the lane that God has developed you for, when you run in the lane that God has been working on you by this anointing through crushing, oh, man, you have so much grace, so much patience, so much energy and time for it because it is exactly where God is put you. The dark room puts you back and keeps you in the correct lane so that you can run your race. That's what obscurity does. And that's where we find David, out in obscurity, being developed for his race. He isn't complaining. He isn't whining. He isn't sneaking into the party trying to get notice. And, 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 and he understands that this is where God has him. This is the purpose in the work. And God loves what he sees in David, that he holds up the party. He literally says, no, 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 stop the party. Because that dude out in obscurity who is running the race I prepared for him, I need him in here now because I'm about to show the world and do a new work through this little shepherd boy. Wow. Now, I don't know if you know this, 
But being a shepherd in that in the first century was the lowest of jobs you could have. So think about the job you would never want to work right now. Like I think about like sanitation workers, people who get down into like the gook of the sanitation tanks and clean it out of all of our bowel movements and junkiness and nastiness. Think about that. That was a shepherd boy. Nobody wanted to be a shepherd. They looked down on shepherd boys, shepherd people. And yet, here's David out in obscurity doing the lowest of lowest jobs. And God says, yeah, that's the one I want. He's out in obscurity because he's allowed me to develop in him the light. So now when I shine the spotlight on him, now, we all know that David still has his own failures. But when the spotlight got big enough, David rose to the occasion. Why? Because the light that was developed in him doing the lowest of lowest was bigger than the light that got on him later on in life. Right? Now, there's so much to this story. I mean, this is how much God loved David. This is, this is God describing David. God said that David was a man after his own heart. That's probably the highest honor God could give anybody. That's how, well, that's what happens when you allow God to develop in you the light before it, it gets on you. And there's so much more to this story, and I encourage, I want you to read, read this story. But here's one last thing I want to share with you that's so fascinating to me, okay, about David's first venture. Because he would eventually go back into the dark room again uh, with his failure that we'll get to at some point in this series. But after David shows up late to the party, Samuel anoints David to be the next king, okay? He anoints David to be the next king of Israel. Did you catch what I said? I didn't say the new king. I said the next king. Now, the word next means something to proceed afterwards, which meant that Saul was still the king when David was anointed the next king of Israel. Now, this is why this is fascinating. Because David was about 17, okay? David was about 17 when he was anointed the next king of Israel. Now, if you fast forward to when David fully, not because he, he became king of one half of God's land and then the other half. When you fast forward to when he became the full king of the entire kingdom, he was around the age of 37, it took approximately 20 years from David to go from the anointed king to the appointed king. 20 years of David waiting his turn. Now, how many of us could wait 20 years to get what God promised us 20 years ago? Can you imagine that? Like, can you imagine if somebody had gone, went to Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, and said, Tim... Steve Jobs is dying, so we're going to make you the next, king, the next CEO of Apple. But it's going to be 20 years from now. You think Tim Cook would have stayed around? If someone came to you and said, hey, I, we, we have watched you work. We love what you do. We want to give you a promotion. We're going to promote you. We're going to take you to this higher pay scale. You're going to get the corner office. You're going to run the whole thing. And you're like, oh, my gosh, that's so exciting. This is awesome, right? And they're like, yes, it's going to be 20 years from now. You're like, all right, peace out. Go find a new job, right? No one's waiting around from that. Can you imagine if, like, let's say you've been dating and your spouse finally comes to you. He gets on one knee. He's looking at you. The moon is glistening in your eye. And he takes your hand and he says, will you marry me? And you're like, oh, my gosh. Ugly cry. Yes. This is amazing. <gasps> and he's like, all right, our wedding will be in 2043. <laughs> Yeah, you're back on Tinder the next day, aren't you? <laughs> right? Because we don't like to wait. Waiting 20 years, it's crazy. It's hard for us to fathom the time frame because we live in a world of instant gratification. We can use microwaves and easy wave oven to make dinner in a matter of minutes. We can find former classmates and friends and family members just by searching through social media. Amazon is working on drone delivery. Instacart will deliver your groceries to your house the same day. I could keep going, but you get the point. We live 
live in such a fast pace, I want it now, got into society. And because of that, we think when we hear the word anointing, it means instant appointing. If we're anointed for something, well, then it must mean it starts now. And this is coming, when I say this, this is coming from a personal experience in this where I've had to have God break my heart, literally, to say, Michael, I've anointed you for something, but you're not ready for it. But if you allow me to do the work that's in, that needs to be done in you, then the work that I will do through you, you will never, be, you will never have been able to imagine what I get to do through you. You see, we have to understand that there is a development process in the middle, in the middle of anointing and appointing. God has anointed each and every one of you for a work you wouldn't believe if he laid it out for you right now. You wouldn't believe it. But before you get to that work, before you see just the tremendous things that God wants to do through your life, you've got to let him do some work in your life. You've got to let God deal with the mess, deal with the hard things, the thing that you've been holding on to, that secret sin that you're just, you know if somebody finds out, it's going to wreck you. The choices that you've been making and you know you felt the Spirit say, I want you to turn, a better, turn to a better way, that is God trying to get you with his arms around your shoulder to walk into this dark room. That where, yes, there's going to be a little bit of crushing. Yes, it's going to be hard. Yes, you're going to have to say goodbye to some things you think were good. Some, some relationships, some friendships, some things that you thought were good for you, but in the long run were never meant for you. You see, because God is trying to develop the light in you to be bigger than the light that can get on you. Because if he does that, I promise you, I promise you, it will be a life worth living. Now you might be here today and you might say, well, Michael, I, I'd like to know what that light is. I've never lived that light in my life. And can I tell you, there's not this like magic, you, you, you follow Jesus today, your life gets 10 times better. It's a process. But here's what I will tell you, that when you follow Jesus, you get better at life over the process. And so if that's you today, I just, just, just bow our heads. And there's nothing special about this prayer. It's literally not. But in your heart right now, would you say yes to Jesus? Would you say to Jesus, God, I want you to take the light that's in me and make it bigger than the light that could be on me? God, would you take this light that's in me and Lord, would you put it through the process of crushing? Would you reveal in me the things that aren't helpful, the things that are holding me back, that are keeping me from experiencing the goodness of your love and grace and forgiveness and acceptance and approval and value and desire and want that only comes in its purest form from the creator, that's you. Jesus, I give you my all today and all I give to you. We pray this in Jesus' name, and the house said,